Hi, Misha here, and this is part four in our holiday hangout week. In the first one, looked at the first gun, the PPK. In the second one, I decided to mix it up a wee bit and look at bolt actions. And in number three, looked at early handguns that I picked up from revolvers to milsurp, and even a couple of modern guns. Now, video four is going to be on early semi-autos and kind of how I got into them. Including AR-15 types, the FAL, G3, and Set Me. And what we would call today PCCs, pistol caliber carbines. Back then, they were just kind of way big nine millimeters now these aren't all the guns that are going to be in the video just a little sampling and some other stuff besides the whole purpose behind this is just to you know be here and hang out over the holiday week and it's a bit of a patreon awareness drive to kind of i don't know just invite people to interact more as we move out of 2021 and getting into 2020 two trying to build stuff up a bit for the channel promote subscribers and uh, just see what we can kind of do you can check out the patreon there's a link in the description it's just a bucking up a month and we do q and a's and other stuff and um still trying to think of what to do for the dale weed tier um, <laughs> but Sure have a lot of fun making these on the main channel here and also over on my personal, my private channel just called Misha where I tend to talk more about military history and a little bit of gun stuff too and a little bit of sci-fi stuff too because, you know, variety is the spice of life. <laughs> but with that, you know, let's start with the AR-15 because in a way, it's one of the first semi-autos that I ever fired in my life. We begin with AR-15s because even though today people tend to think of me and AKs more, some think I don't even like the AR. The truth is, yeah, I had a lot more experience with the AR than I did the AK when I started this journey. As I've said in multiple videos, I grew up with an SP-1. And of course, just, you know, knowing the U.S. military, the M16A2 from the Gulf War and the M4. So once I decided to go modern, I really, uh, you know, I did seek an AR out early on, but it would be a little while because they were expensive back then, eight to a thousand. And this was during the assault weapons ban, so you didn't get all the features. And Colts were very hard to get and pricey then. My first couple were more or less off-brand type things, although Bushmasters were around, and they were pretty good. I thought about bringing the SP-1 out, but I brought these two because they have some value to me. Starting here with my, well, this is technically a 60, you know, 6920, 6921, as I've said in multiple videos, I really wanted a real M4 because this was the new cutting-edge gun, late 90s, early 2000s, but you couldn't get it as such with the flash hider bayonet lug and most importantly this scary sliding shoulder stock now some makers like bushmaster would do one with the stock on but it'd be pinned in the open position of course even though the assault weapons been happened you could find assemblies and you could screw them into your lowers of course you would be in violation So I always wanted to have just a basic bog standard M4. And until Colts really came out, it wasn't as easy as you might think. For example, you could get the Smith & Wesson M&P. It had the ovular handguard, but it only had one heat shield. Also, it had the sling swivel on the bottom, not the side. And a lot of those didn't quite have the right stock, and they were usually six position versus four. And I do like shooting the M4 pattern. 
I think it'll always hold a special place just because I did buy an M4 from Wilson pretty early on in my adventure, about 2003, and um, a lot of friends loved it. That was one of the first times I saved up all semester to buy a gun, and it just became popular. Of course, it did have to have the fixed buttstock, and Wilson did their best with a the muzzle device. They had a quote-unquote muzzle brake that looked an awful lot like a flash rider, but it was a quote-unquote muzzle brake. So it was about as good as you could get back then. Had a lot of fun with it. And for a long time, just having an M4 was great. But then I got into retro M16ing. And that's when I think I really started to appreciate the AR. Again, growing up with the SP1, I knew ab about it. But it happened when I went to a friend's farm and shot his A1 build. And that's when the surplus uppers were available post 2000 and so uh, they were you could buy one for two 250 bucks and lowers well for a little bit i tried to make myself happy with an a2 because he described the differences to me and i thought oh what's a little bit of machining here and back here but eventually i coughed up the money for a nodak and never looked back. And this is my original. I guess this is probably my first retro build that I did. This is the original upper. I did improve the hand guards a bit. And again, I swapped the A2. I think it was an Aero Precision for a Nodak eons ago. And uh, has the original Colt barrel. Of course, I've had SP1s over time, and I've. I've progressively got older and older SP1s. I had 70s ones and then late 60s and now mid 60s. The only problem with having a mid 60s SP1 is too collectible. So you don't really want to shoot it. I have shot it a couple of times, but yeah. So this uh, A1 here is a great shooter. I love how light and svelte, keep it simple, stupid, it is. That to me is what the AR should be. So the young tactical kit in me like the M4 styles but as I did get older I appreciated the traditional look and feel more and that's kind of where I've shifted to as time goes on but this one was a lot of fun because I built it very inexpensive and this is where I learned how to put and lower together and do some other basic AR-15 maintenance work even from the beginning, I thought the forward assist was a bit vestigial. But I did like the AR. I really did. I still do. It has a lot of neat things. The only bad thing back then, ammo was cheap. Yay. But because of the assault weapons ban, you had to have a magazine pre-94, if you wanted to be legal at least. A lot of the mags floating around were starting to get pretty worn out after 2000. 2001. So you had to make sure you had good mags. The good news is 20 rounders are everywhere. 30 rounders, meh, not too bad. But you couldn't get anything bigger. If you try to get, say, I remember once I picked up a 40 at a store, and it was pre van but it was very clearly aftermarket. It was blued. It was crap. It didn't work for anything. And uh, actually, back in the day, that was one of the big claims to fame for the Ruger Mini 14, that it had reliable magazines. Today, AR mags are, are, are very good, very reliable, but it, it, it was an evolution because a mag is very important. But I will say, as far as pre-bands go, the mags were more available for ARs because they've been around for so long. Newer guns, it did get harder to find mags for them, and some you just couldn't. But thank God the assault weapons ban was lifted, and that really did expand things. That's when I... Ended up eventually getting a Colt M4 type, and I did this build because I just I wasn't terribly interested before. Plus, I really didn't have the money. If you want to go buy a Bushmaster or a DPMS, they really were close to a thousand bucks. And this at a time when you could get an AK for 300, 400, or even an FAL for 500 to 600. So it just didn't make sense. That's the time we live in now. ARs are a good thing to invest in. They're the one thing that hasn't gone bananas. 
And actually, speaking of FAL, that might have been my first semi-auto as an adult. <laughs> eh, my nervous first, but we'll see. Let's talk about FALs. So the AR I was reasonably familiar with growing up with one. AKs were around, like the Chinese, as were SKSs in the 90s. But it would not be until I met Doc, who I've mentioned and I think has featured in a couple of videos recently because he was out shooting with us this year, that I learned about the FNFAL, really. Really hadn't heard about it. And no one I knew owned one. It just wasn't a thing. And I remember when I met him, went over, his son took me over to his house, said, hey, here's my dad, and he was working on an FAL. I think it was a South African or a West German. I think it was a South African, though. And he put it in my hands, and I thought, now this is a rifle. Like this, it felt real. It was heavy in the right way. It was long. It felt like something. It was, you could tell that it was a true rifle firing a rifle cartridge and then he handed me one of the mags and I was like holy hell you know compared to an AR or even an AK mag that's something and then he told me that mags were like five bucks because pre-brand FAO mags were everywhere and I was sold um, and it kind of went from there and I picked these two as I've said in previous videos the first build I ever did was with an STG 58 kit on a Kunin Second build was an L1A1 on a Hess because they're the only ones who did inches. But these two, eh, picked for a couple of reasons. This one, even though it is on an inbell receiver and an Israeli heavy barrel kit, and even though it was assembled here in the USA by Springfield, it was the first pre ban I ever owned. And it was actually found locally, I think it was in a newspaper. Yeah, Springfield had these kits in the 80s, and they assembled them on M-Bell receivers. So it is a build, but no 922R concerns, no anything. Of course, it has a bipod. I just don't have it attached. And for whatever reason, I really wanted an Israeli heavy barrel. It just seemed interesting to me, and I really like it. But yeah, this one was local, and... Uh, wasn't a bad amount of money. I think he wanted 1100 for it with a couple of mags and stuff. For a pre ban even though it was a kit build, it's fine. It's fine. I've always had a thing for heavy barrels, and this might have been my first heavy barrel LMG type gun. Don't know. Now, I picked the Argentinian paratrooper here. Sorry, no camera. Because this was the first one I really was interested in independently. Before that, I kind of had gone with Doc. I did find he didn't have an SCG-58, but he had the G1. And I did call him, hey, is this a good kit? And he goes, oh, yeah, it's, it's good. So, And then all that. This one was me. that I just I read about paratroopers. I thought it was interesting and kind of went off on my own. In fact, I remember when I got my first one, he actually wanted to come over. And we did. We went to a range and uh, shot it. That was a DSA para. It was an STG 58 kit build using mostly Australian parts, but they're lower. And I found it very gently used. Of course, this is a pre ban Argentinian. But what really intrigued me was how they relocated the recoil system from the stock to the top cover. I, I don't know why, just reading about that system just super intrigued me. And so that was the first time I really bought a gun, essentially because of mechanics. I bought other guns because I liked them, because it was a good deal. The first FAL paratrooper I bought because I thought it was mechanically interesting. And that DSA was a good gun. But of course, once I found this one through my friend Steve... I uh, sold the DSA because, yeah, why wouldn't you? But it was a good gun. It, it, it ran very reliably. For a time between the mid-late 90s and uh, mid-late 2000s, the FAL was one of the best ways to get a quality military-grade 7.62 NATO, often marked 308, gun for not a lot of money. 
you could get early imports like the uh, Century L1A1 Sporter or R1A1 Sporter. These were usually M-Bell receivers, like this one. But they had L1A1 parts kits, sometimes other parts kits, assembled on them with thumbhole stocks. And you could pick those up for little or nothing. Um, probably for less than what just an inbound receiver goes for today. I remember buying them for, I don't know, 400 bucks. Again, they were neutered, of course, but they were still functional guns and they were a fun restoration project. People also found inbells everywhere, receivers and kits, and could build an all inbell gun. You could also get the Postman SAR 4800s for not a lot of money and restore those. I bought my first one of those for about 800 so they, they brought a little more because the reputation of the centuries was, even though they were imports, they were assembled by them. You know how century goes. But the Argentinians were the same way. You could get the so-called Saclata, they're marked in here, Saclata, post bands for under a thousand, sometimes six, seven hundred. You could even get the pre-bands. I bought my first pre-band almost by accident. It's like 1200 bucks for a pre-band FMAP, FAL. It's just because people didn't know what they were and, you know, it wasn't Belgian. Now, the Belgian guns were always kind of spendy, to be fair, but not like today. And the Israelis were kind of always all over the place, high, low, in between. Even the Israeli import pre-bands, the SBLs, were assembled using used parts on a new receiver. So this one being a U.S. assembled isn't too egregious. But it was a lot of fun. Tons of variations. And you could get them, uh, you know, L1A1s for the inch. You had the Israelis. You had heavy barrels, paratroopers. And it, they didn't break the bank. And the nice thing about the FAL, you could do a really good job of assembling one at home. Because there's no riveting, no welding. All you need is some method of screwing the barrel into the receiver. And then checking for headspace. And then getting the right locking shoulder. Everything else is just screwing it together. A little bit of file fitting maybe. So, the, And that's also one of my earliest experiences with uh, more advanced guns missing than uh, AR-15s. And uh, I had good luck. I know Jay's luck with FALs was never great. They always seemed to jam on him. But for me, they always seemed to run pretty darn well. Maybe it's because I talk nice to them. However... Some of my early experiences in guns that didn't run well, or that weren't well done, well, would it shock you to learn they came from Century. Much as the AR is always compared and contrasted to the AK, the FNFAL, the LNA1, is compared and contrasted to the HKG3, the Spanish set me. And while I was first into FALs, I wasn't immune to a lot of the hype surrounding the roller guns that we started to see in the 90s and early 2000s. Before that, they were around, they were respected, but because of uh, movies, video games, and just internet culture in general, it really became a thing. Now, of course, the MP5, the HK94, that was a lot of it, but the 308, the 762 NATO versions, eh, yeah. And there was lots of kits that came in, plus we had pre-bands and some post-bands. And Century Arms built them quite affordably. <clears throat> and I had a lot of early experiences with them. Many less than awesome. My two here are imports. My first HKG3 was on a Federal receiver. It is an interesting receiver. It had kind of a pebble grain texture and it had a Picatinny rail in it. This was a cast receiver, which sounds terrible, and yeah. but considering this is a stamped receiver anyway, yeah, it was just kind of big and blocky, not all that good looking, but it seemed to work okay. The only problem is, A, it was a ban era gun, so it had a muzzle brake pinned on, which actually went flying off when I shot it for the first time. 
no bayonet lug, which is not a big deal, that's easily done. <clears throat> and the previous owner had spray painted it desert. But it was cheap, like $300, and it came with a basket full of mags. Setmes were also everywhere. And at one time, you could order them from Century for $2.99 from the store. And that was right after the assault weapons ban came off, too. So you could actually get a flash hider and working bayonet lug. Now these guns would all have the original barrels, for better or worse. Because it wasn't until 2005 that the barrel ban occurred. So kits started losing their barrels. The thing about the Century guns, they were affordable, so everyone got one. But the quality was not fantastic. They... Typically didn't build them by pulling the barrel from the trunnion and doing it the right way. They just shoved the barrel and trunnion together into a receiver and they welded it. A lot of times the actions were real crunchy, real dirty, and a lot of leftover. So they were pretty, uh, pretty stout on the recoil. It seems like the G3s were a little better put together but I think part of it was the G3 kits were sometimes in better shape a lot of the Spanish kits were well used not all of them oh and another thing too because it's a roller delay system Sentry would sometimes grind things to fit and have headspace work so that's never a good idea don't do that on FALs either don't don't grind your locking shoulder to fit <clears throat> now this one down here this is a Springfield import. They imported the SAR-3 pre-ban and the SAR-8 post-ban. And you could pick up the SAR-8s for a song for quite a long time, and they were a great way to get a factory gun. The only actual setmes that came in were these Mars imports, which compared to HKs were uh, a lot cheaper, but still a pretty bad price point but it's really the best way to get a set me aside from building it yourself maybe the problem with that whereas the FAL yeah you can put it together at home you don't need any welding equipment riveting equipment not so with these guns welding and some other specialized things are required for assembling a roller delayed gun be it or Spanish set me or German HK. Yeah. This is not difficult. You don't need a huge shop, but it's it's you need to be set up, especially if you want to bend and weld your own flats and aren't buying pre-formed receiver shells. It's up to you, but yeah, it's kind of um, yeah. So the FAL was just a better bet for my mind as far as building. I will say these are light and when they work well, they do work well. They were the other gun. I do like them, I really do. But there just aren't as many interesting variations here to collect like they are the FALs. You kinda get a G3, G3, A2, A3, A4, what have you, maybe a G3K, that's pretty much it. Set means there's really only the variant. You know, there's the original Model A, B, Cs, uh, but really it's just the Model 58 and the Model 64, and you don't find many Model 58 kits. So there's just not a lot. That's why I just have one of each, and uh, I'm happy with my choices here. I've actually had a few different Mars set me's. I kind of kept this one because it does have some wear on it, a little bit of old rust. I didn't put it there. It was there. But that's actually good for me. It means I don't at all worry about shooting it. It also meant I replaced the sporter butt plate with the standard one. And I did install the bayonet lug. I would have felt a little guilty doing that to a pristine example. But since it already has honest wear and tear that I didn't put there, it's kind of key. I feel bad when I do it. And kind of the same thing with this uh, SAR-38. I don't know. I kind of like it better than the HKs. I like that it has a nice even phosphate finish. And I added a clipped and pinned lower just because 
I did add the bayonet lug. It has the removable. And I even have a front sight base with the grenade ring to go around the barrel, like here on the set me. I just never did get around to installing it. But then again, it's a it's a true import. But it's not so expensive like the HK is that you would uh, be afraid to shoot it. I just realized with these kinds of guns, trying to buy clones or copies, unless it's custom built, even good builds like, say, the Vectors, they, I don't know, they just don't quite nail it right. So with these, you just, you really need to go, go right or go home. Again, I like them. I really do. I've done several videos on them. I just don't quite feel that same spark that I do with the FAL, and I never have. That said, I've always kept one around. If I do sell it, I end up picking up another one. So I always wanted one in the stable. Kind of feels weird not to have it. But I never felt much need to have more. Your mileage may vary. And with that, we've kind of looked at some big 308s. Let's go to the other extreme. 9mm, what we call today PCCs. Back in the day, I usually called them sub carbines, sub guns, or stupid guns with stupid sticky addy barrels because I really didn't. I wanted so much to love them, but the barrels killed it for me. And when I started, I don't know how long it took before I heard the term SBR, it wasn't common. 20 years ago, people were not SBRing, and the whole quote-unquote pistol thing, very uncommon, and arm braces weren't even a thought yet. So options were limited, but they were so cool, yet not cool. It's like so cool in the back, and then the front. And one thing that really bugged me too, because see, another gun I grew up with was an open bolt Mac 10, some auto, so I knew that. And it bugged me so much that the newer guns had to be closed bolt. But as much as I was kind of ee, on the G3 set me, I wanted an MP5 in the worst way. And the sticky eddy barrel bugged me. However, it was at least firing from a closed bolt as God intended. So for a while, I had a little rule. No open to closed bolt conversions. I can deal with it being semi-auto only. But yeah, and I really wanted an MP5. I remember they were advertised in Shotgun News and different various things. But that was a, a dark time, the early 2000s. Popularity was up, supply was down. Pre-bands had gone out of sight price-wise. And that was really it. We didn't have any other imports. So it was either try to build your own, which was not as easy then as it is now, or accept something from Todd Bailey, which I tried. Oh, God, did I try. I had a special weapons. I had a Bobcat other early things. The Bobcat was a piece of crap. The special weapons actually ran just Jim Dandy. It just looked like ass. Like the welds and stuff were just not good. I wanted one so much. But I never could get one that looked right and ran right. That's why when these POFs came in in 2014, I was super excited. Now, as I said in the anniversary video, the first was actually the MKE imported by ATI back in 2010, 2011. Those were good, and I happily got one of those and was tickled with it. But the POFs did everything the MKEs did and had more. And this gun here is a little special to me because it was uh, maybe the first gun that Atlantic sent me. Kind of the first time someone keyed me in early. So, yeah, I could have mentioned the HK SP5s, and it's awesome that we now have a true HK MP5s again. Objectively, yeah, worth more, more collectible. But to me, the, 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 uh, the POFs still hold the spot. And what's nice is they do come in as quote-unquote pistols, 
So you don't have to chop this stupid barrel down. We finally kind of got away from the stupid long barrel thing. Moving down, another gun. Almost every gun shop back then had an Uzi. And it was usually an IMI Uzi because a lot of these came in. Now, funny thing, it seems like every time I would find or buy an IMI Uzi, it was a Model A. According to a lot of other people, though, they mostly see Model Bs. I've never owned a Model B, not because I've tried to avoid one. One just never came my way. And this was one of those guns. It wasn't too expensive, about 800 bucks. So I had to save up a little bit. And mags were affordable and gettable, which was important during the assault weapons ban. Because you don't want to run 10 round mags, that's lame. And I've had a few over the years. This one's obviously a shooter. But I mean, it's an Uzi. I mean, yeah. I never really got tired of an Uzi and sold it. The only time I lost a Model A was when I ended up wanting something more and... I could always find a friend that would go, I'll give you money for that if you, you know, sell your Uzi. I could always move them, and I could always find more. Of course, then later we get several builds from Vector, Century Arms, and the like. And this isn't too bad of a build. There's some welding and stuff required, but it's a 9mm. Overbuilt. Not very practical. The nice thing is, if you do do a build, you can at least make it as a pistol instead of having the long barrel. It's up to you. But no, I like the uh, Uzi. Always have. It was one that really kind of hurt me as far as the closed bolt conversion. But it's actually this gun here that really got me to change my tune and kind of just go to hell with it. I enjoy it. Even though I know these guns are kind of silly. They're big. They fire a 9mm. They have to have the stupid long barrel later, you know arm brace and short barrel if you wanted and they fire from a closed bolt but the British Sterling my god I just this is probably my favorite both in terms of look and how it shoots it just it just has everything for me it's when I was able to pick up one of these that I just had to abandon I had to be true to myself and just abandon the notion that I wasn't going to get out these sticky addy barrel guns. I just, I wanted one of these too much. And this is actually the one that kind of got me into doing older builds and custom builds like the PPSH-41 and the Sten and so on. So it was kind of a gateway drug gun for me. And for a while, these were pretty unknown before the Wise Lights came out. So you could pick up a pre band English made example for not a whole lot more than an Uzi. Of all of these, for a long time, the uh, MP5s were the highest, highest, excuse me. Aside from it just being an MP5, I think the reason I was one on one looking at the, the look of the A2 here, it does look like a baby rifle. It looks like a G3. I just, it's, it's just like they shrunk it down. Whereas a lot of your other submachine guns look like these that are, you know, their own configuration. This one does look like it's just a rifle, just tiny. The Uzi, yeah, it was just, it's an Uzi. Why would you not? And they were affordable enough. They, these were just fun weekend guns. Everyone wanted to shoot an Uzi. Plus, you kind of got your, your workout in, because this is a heavy mofo. You could also easily accessorize the stock. I've got the wood one on now, the underfolder. There's even a, a black synthetic version of this stock that's pretty cool looking. And they make several different barrels. It's a QD barrel. So you can easily SBR it or add a suppressor. Whatever you'd like to do. The Sten and the Sterling, on the other hand, are pretty much in the configuration you see them in here. But they're British. They were used in the Gulf War. they just such a classic thing. I would never probably SBR this one because the pre-bands are getting collectible. Fun fact, the very first gun that I received on my FFL was a Sterling Mark VII pistol built by Wise Light. It was one of only 12 that they did. So that was pretty neat, the very first time I received a gun. When I had this one here, I also had the pre-band Mark VII with it, but 
I just wasn't as enamored with it and there wasn't a good way to attach either an arm brace or a shoulder stock. So eventually when prices went nanners, I, uh, I moved it along. I kept the Mark VI carbine here and probably will never ever sell it. But I will shoot it and have done many times. It's too nice to be a safe coin. Also, all these guns took magazines that were pre-banned, so that made it easier during the thing. But didn't really get into this too heavily, except for the special weapons and, and pre-banned Uzi, until after the assault weapons ban. And as you know from the channel, I've got, uh, I've got several. What else can we talk about? As we near the end, we gotta talk about shotguns. Everything else has been semi-auto, but... Had to bring out the Mossenberg here. To be fair, it puts multiple pellets in the air at once. I could have been cheeky and brought the Benelli M4 out, but it took me a long time to get one of those. The Mossberg, on the other hand, was really the first pump shotgun I owned. Now, not this one, but it was a Mossberg 500. In fact, when I bought, had that Mossberg 500, you could only get that or the 590. The 590A1 didn't exist yet for commercial sales. And this one I have set up here. A long time ago, there was a picture of one on the Modern Firearms Russian website run by Max. And this is how it was set up. But Mossberg never sold one with all these features. Full tube, bayonet lug, heavy wall barrel, shroud, strap on the pump, ghost string sights, metal trigger guard, and speed feed buttstock. So that's why I eventually just, I just, I don't know why, this just struck me as the ultimate Mossberg. And I've talked about why I like these. I, they just fit me well. So for many years, it was a Mossberg 12 gauge pump. And I've never had a big shotgun collection. Just never really felt the need. I always had a few but never wanted to have every one. But considering I couldn't find a trench gun for the longest time, I did try the 1897 Chinese copies, but had less than stellar results. This is at least a modern trench gun. And um, you can debate Remington or Mossberg, but the fact is Mossberg sold their military model here. Now this one, the Vepr 12, it's relatively new. And by that I mean these started coming over the last 10 years. Now I did mess with converting Sega 12s for a long time. But what was so nice about these, you did not have to convert them. They came over with a threaded muzzle, so all you had to do was put on the correct device or whatever you wanted. They came on with standard handguards, standard pistol grip, and a, either a fixed or a folding standard stock. And they had the magwell, something people spend lots of money to in incorporate to Sega's often. The hardest thing to get were the eight round mags in the beginning, but even they were a lot easier to get than the eight round factory Sega mags. And when these came out, they were eleven, twelve hundred dollars $1,200, but then prices dropped to 800, and for a little bit there, this was the best damn deal in the in the market and they're pure true blue Russian guns this is probably the pinnacle of Russian imports before you know sanctions and everything and I have to say that just being able to get Russian made rifles pistols shotguns at all was a pipe dream 20 years ago and it's very sad that it's gone now but I honestly just feel like we were fortunate to get anything at all and prices are pretty damn fair for a long time. So these are just neat guns. And again, I don't need every shotgun, but this is a kind of a close contender for the Benelli M4 as far as my favorite semi-auto shotgun. Even today, I still enjoy the, the Mossberg, something I picked up almost from the beginning, at least a version of. I still really like it. I think I just got lucky by going with the Mossberg. I originally kind of focused more on them than Remington just because they had a more interesting catalog and they were more affordable. 
a little more bang for your buck. Don't know, but I'm, I'm glad I did. Again, the Vepers today, like the Segas, are sanctioned from import. So, it's kind of it. But, it's really neat to get a piece of Russian police, Russian military equipment. Pretty much made to spec. All thing they had to do is extend the barrel slightly. Over in Russia, it's a 16.9 inch barrel. For here, they had to extend it a little, about an inch and a half. They ended up doing close to 19 inches. So, other than that, it was a neat thing. I like shotguns, but in, in small doses, both in terms of shooting and collecting. I just never quite got into the more exotic ones, like the spas and stuff. That's just me, though. Your mileage definitely can vary. Am I forgetting anything? Hmm. And to wrap the video up, AKs. I'm pretty sure if I didn't talk about AKs, someone would say something. What do you think? Now, I could have taken the simple and very obvious way out of going on about my remaining SAR again. But I think the cabin video from October did a good job of talking about that. So I wanted to talk about some guns that kind of shaped my personal identity and taste and everything when it comes to AKs. Because to be fair, when I bought the SAR one, I was just buying an AK more or less on a bet. I hadn't researched it. I didn't really know much about AKs. I didn't say I want this one or that one. These guns, though, were early guns that I picked, that I wanted, that I knew about. And the first would be the Romanian SAR2. Yeah, I like the one. And so I knew what they were. But it was really wanting to get into 545, long before many people had even heard of it. Around 2002, I started saving up for this, buying it in 2003. And this is my original gun. What's not so original, I don't know how many times I swapped furniture on this guy over the years. Although this stock has been with it quite a bit. This was also the gun that I learned how to change JK furniture on, namely figuring out how to do the upper handguard. <laughs> Remember, kind of early days, long before YouTube videos, teaching you tutorial stuff. And then, of course, when the assault weapons ban came off, that's when I put this stock on, I promise, not before. And then parts came in where you could do a front-end conversion, and that was great. That was fun. Um, so it was one that I special ordered, that I wanted, and that I had to learn how to hunt for 545 ammo for, because it was not readily available. This was a few years before the surplus 7 and 6 came in. Around that time, though, were a bunch of milled parts kits. You could get the PLO kits that were Russian, but they were a little rough. Some of them, anyway. Cheaper and in beautiful condition were these, the Hungarian AK-55 kits. Now, I did actually buy one of those kits. But before I could find someone help me get it together, because finding a milled receiver back then was not always easy, I ended up going this route here, the SLR 100H. These were done by several companies, including Gordon Tech, and uh, really were done the way I would have done it anyway. And so this was me kind of branching, at, branching out from just the basic AKM and really learning about the history. And this is with, with the original machined receiver guns where I learned all the differences, like the smooth top cover, the ported gas tube. It was learning about these types that really started me on my journey of educating about it. Before that, I mostly bought AKs just to be, uh, just to shoot them at the range and have fun. But with these, I started to get more into the history. And by this time, more and more websites started to pop up with more and more information. And I guess we're keeping the Hungarian thing going because finally around here, I've got the AMD 65. I don't know what first got me into these. Uh, parts kits were everywhere. In fact, back in the day of... As I was saying before my battery pooped down on me there. 
parts kits were everywhere, and these were the first ones that I ever saw people really building in the pistols. This was before Dracos were coming in. So that was a thing. I, there were no pre-bands, of course, except for the uh, full-size guns, but no AMD types, really. And because of the folding stock and everything, I wasn't too keen on getting one of these until the assault weapons band sunset. When it did, I immediately ordered one from Vector in late 2004. They built it, shipped it to Alaska. It went up to Alaska, I think to a pharmacy up there, and disappeared into the ether, according to the tracking number. Yeah, 15 years ago, tracking wasn't quite what it is today. So that was my first effort to get an AMD. Uh, it didn't even get to my hands. My second effort, this is when Century started building theirs. Unfortunately, these had a U.S. barrel and a U.S. receiver, but they were nice enough, I suppose. And so I bought one. And the first time I took it out shooting, this front handguard retainer slid forward. Turns out it was broken. Well, that kind of disgusted me. So they did replace it, and I didn't even take it out of the gun shop. I just asked my friend there just to sell it. So I was kind of AMD-less after two efforts, but I guess third try is the charm because then these Tennessee gun versions came out. FEG receiver, FEG barrel, and they were very affordable. They were actually cheaper than the Centuries. So I picked one of these up, and aside from needing to add the rear sling swivel, it's pretty well good to go. This is exactly how I would have built, built it myself. I don't think I would SBR this just because there's only this much of an extension, so that's not really, to me, enough worth SBRing. You may disagree. That's perfectly fine. But I really enjoy shooting these. This is definitely a love it or love it or hate it gun, though. It's weird. It's unique. It's different. And it's not really something you're going to attach optics to. But I love how lightweight it is and how compact it is, even with this extension on the barrel. And this is, by this point, where I know where I'm at. I like original receiver. I like original barrel. I want as close to military as possible. By this point, I know who and what I am. <laughs> this gun helped me learn. And when I bought the SAR-1 and the SAR-2, I was just, I, I didn't really know. To be fair, a lot of us didn't know. The AK was kind of an unknown quantity. I just got lucky and kind of stumbled into it before it became hot, which was what allowed me to get a collection built up of them before prices went nuts. Also, these AMDs have a special place because in my business, they were among the first products I really routinely carried because Centerfire had them under $400 brand new, so I was able to buy them. And kind of add to the capital. So that was kind of neat. The uh, Sterling there was the first gun I ever had on my FFL. This one was one of the first ones I ever bought in larger numbers. And I don't know how many I moved, but a bit. <laughs> Several dozens. But these are really nice guns. As I've said in past videos, I actually prefer a well-done SLR 100 over... A Polytech legend. I know that's sacrilege, but that's how I feel. And for a long time, these SAR2s were a sleeper in the 545 community. Everyone focused on the Segas, the Vepers, or the Arsenals. These were factory guns, and for many years, they were very affordable. Of course, now they've gone crazy. But I've talked so much about AKs in past videos, so I'm not going to make this video all about them. But I had to mention them, or... Someone would say something. Like Kobo. Well, there we have it, guys. And there we have it. You know, today we have a lot of options when it comes to self-loading guns. If you want to call them MSRs, Modern Sporting Rifles, or Evil Black Rifles, EBRs. But 20 years ago, the options were much more limited. There were perhaps more FALs and G3 types around then, but we did not have as many PCCs, didn't have as many AK options, although they were significantly cheaper. 
and certainly didn't have as many AR-15 options back then, and they were actually more expensive. So, you know, win some, you lose some. It may seem like we're on the downhill slide, like things are too expensive now, but the fact is some things like ARs are cheaper, and other things like AKs, yeah, even if they're expensive, we do have a lot more options. So, you know, there's that. And it's just become more socially acceptable. I don't know how else to say it. Back then, not many people owned guns with pistol grips and detaching mags. And today, almost everyone does. And even if they don't, they don't really think much of it. So I think in some sense, the overall attitude has greatly improved. And it's kind of there to, to witness it. It's just my taste in guns. Anyway, I appreciate you hanging out. Yeah. If you could, do please like, share, and subscribe. Like I said, this is trying to kind of promote things as we head into 2022 and try to uh, maybe do some more fun stuff on the channel next year. If you, uh, if you could, please do comment. It's always fun. And if you can help support the channel, then go over and check out the Patreon page. The link's in the description. You can see if anything... Anything suits you, fancy. If it doesn't, I understand completely. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed hanging out here. We've got one more video to knock out. And then we'll be done with 2021. I don't think many people are going to be sad to see this year go. What do you think? This is Misha, and I'll catch you one more time very soon.